Thank you, Michal. Um, yeah, first of all, let me uh, thank you everyone for, for having me and inviting me to this seminar. Uh, it's, it's 2 a.m. here, but I'm, I'm still very grateful to be joining you and to present um, what I think is, is pretty exciting work. I'm gonna share my screen and we can just uh, get started. Let's see, share. Okay, uh, can everybody see my screen? Great, yeah, so yeah, as, as uh, um, Michal said, uh, yeah, my title is uh, Multimode Entanglement Swapping via Spectrally Resolved Measurements. And this is some work that um, we kind of, we, we started a few years ago back in Oxford, but we uh, took it to a whole other level uh, when, when we uh, rebuilt the lab here in Oregon. My, uh, uh, I'm grateful to my co-authors, Valerian Thiel, Alex Davis, and Brian Smith. Um, Alex Davis is, uh, used to be in Oxford. He's, he's now in Bath. Uh, Brian, is, Brian is, of course, my, my advisor. He was in Oxford, and now he's, he's in Oregon. Um, and uh, yeah, so this, uh, this picture here is uh, what you get when you put two photons onto a beam splitter and resolve their spectrum. Uh, together at the output. And I like to think of this as uh, each little pixel here has its own story to tell. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean uh, in, in a little bit. So, uh, but the uh, uh, outline of my talk is I'm, I'm gonna first introduce some preliminaries, kind of uh, get up to speed. Uh, just as a warning, we're gonna be kind of trying to think about sort of a four dimensional space because we're talking about four photon measurements. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to build up to that with some prelim preliminaries. Uh, and then after that, you know, we're going to get to the main results. And then if there's time, there's like some other fun stuff we're going to talk about and then, um, and then, and then finally conclude. So, uh, just kind of going right into it. This is my, um, little one page crash course on quantum optics. Uh, so, you know, the main thing we need to know is, uh, light has these four degrees of freedom that we, um, uh, uh, like to to deal with, especially when it comes to encoding information. And so you've got a you, if you think of like a laser beam, you have uh, say say you point the laser beam at the wall. Usually you'd see like a uh, like a circular blob, so like a Gaussian beam. But you can have these sort of higher order modes. And in general, this makes this transverse spatial degree of freedom x and y. Uh, uh, you've also got the longitudinal degree of freedom, which because of the speed of light, that's constrained. Um, and you can just really think of this as the uh, time and frequency degree of freedom. So that, you know, your envelope of a light pulse and as well as polarization. So that, that makes your, your four degrees of freedom. And if you think of uh, the light field, uh, it has, you know, you can completely descri describe the, a, a mode of the light field in terms of these four, four numbers. And these, uh, these modes are solutions to Maxwell's equation. So they're classical objects here. Um, you've got sort of, yeah, you've got your longitudinal, which is your, your Z direction, which is again, constrained by the speed of light, um, your X and Y, and then your polarization is because the light field is a vector. So um, you can think of, you know, in, in terms of this, uh, in terms of a quantum information perspective, you can think of each mode as a vector in this giant, uh, uncountably infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And uh, uh, the, the mode again is a classical object, but a single photon occupying a mode is, is quantum mechanical because it's a single photon. And I'm focusing on the single photon aspect because that's, uh, that's what we're gonna be dealing with. And, and you can think of the state of a single photon as uh, all of the information about it is, is just the mode that it occupies. So these, these four degrees of freedom. And we're going to zoom in and kind of focus on this time frequency degree of freedom. Um, so how would you encode information in that? Um, so with frequencies, you can think of essentially colors. You can so, uh, you divide your, your frequency space, you know, all these colors and, and have each frequency bin stand for a symbol. Likewise, you can do the same thing in time. You can think of like a pulse train and each time bin can can stand for a symbol in your in your alphabet. 
or more generally, you can have uh, superpositions of these. So you can have these uh, pulse modes uh, pul or pulse shapes here. I'm showing like these Hermit Gauss shapes. Uh, each of these is a uh, superposition of frequency modes, but also of time uh, of time modes by, by Fourier transform. And so each of these modes J, uh, you can have a creation operator in the mode J, which says, you know, create a photon uh, in this uh, in this mode shape. And, and provided these are orthogonal, they obey these uh, standard bosonic commutation relations. And so, so there's lots of ways to slice up this space. And, and, and in all of these ways, it's an infinite dimensional Hilbert, Hilbert space. And so that's, uh, uh, we think of that as an advantage because it has a high information capacity. And although you could do the same thing with spatial modes, uh, time and frequency have the advantage of being uh, robust with uh, fiber and free space communications. Uh, for example, going through a fiber free space tends to scramble up the spatial or polarization of light. Whereas, for example, colors, they remain orthogonal with propagation. And it's been shown recently, uh, um, yeah, this is a nice review uh, showing how uh, uh, information encoding in this, in this uh, domain of light, you can have this complete toolkit for, for quantum information processing if you use single photons encoded in time frequency modes. There was also a recent paper from our group um, using essentially the uh, electro-optic modulation type of stuff that, uh, that Michal does, uh, showing how you can have arbitrary unitary transformations converting between all these kind of mode bases. Uh, so, so we know it's, it's nice and it's robust and it's high dimensional. Um, uh, and so, yeah, the next preliminary thing I want to talk about is, is two photon states and time frequency entanglement that you can have when, once you have two photons um, in this sort of, you know, single photon picture. And, and the sort of easiest example I think of is, is parametric down conversion, also because that's what we're going to use today, um, which is this nonlinear process where you pump a, a crystal with uh, with a blue laser, and what you can think of uh, as happening is probabilistically a blue photon splits into two red photons, such that um, energy and momentum are conserved, and you get this two photon state. In general, you have many different color combinations, frequency combinations that still conserve this momentum, and that gives rise to what we call time frequency entanglement. Um, we can characterize this two photon state with uh, by this uh, two frequency function called the joint spectral amplitude. So it's a spectrum for, um, it's a two, a two frequency spectrum. And in general, this cannot be factorized into a product of frequencies. And that's when this entanglement arises. And we like to measure this quantity, the, the mod squared of this, which the, is the joint spectral intensity or JSI. So these things are gonna uh, feature later on in the talk. Um, you can quantify the entanglement in, in something like this by doing, for example, a Schmidt decomposition of this kind of thing. And, um, and, and you can essentially think of that as counting the number of independent mode pairs that go into making this up and you have this Schmidt number uh, K, uh, which, which is the number of independent modes that you need to describe this. Uh, there's a nice uh, paper here on how you can use a state like this for quantum key distribution. Uh, in this time frequency domain. Um, so, and then finally, the, the last sort of preliminary is the entanglement swapping protocol. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but just a quick review. Uh, this was first demonstrated experimentally by Pan and uh, Baumeister in 1998. And the idea is you have uh, two parties, Alice and Bob, each of them produce, uh, they have a source of entangled photons, let's say, that are um, entangled in their polarization. So Alice's photons are in this um, Bell state, horizontal, vertical, minus, vice versa. So it's a single uh, polarization Bell state. And the same with Bob. And the idea is that Charlie over here does a, performs a Bell state measurement and projects photons two and three onto a Bell state. 
And by that measurement, one and four get projected onto this singlet bell state, uh, HV minus VH. And so experimentally, what that would look like is uh, you detect photons two and three at polarizations H and V, and, and, and you produce this state psi uh, or project onto that state psi. So that's remarkable because one and four were, have never interacted, but now they're, they're in this entangled state. Uh, so this has been realized many times since then, you know, this polarization, polarization uh, time bins in 2007. So detecting them, these photons at different times and also in the spatial modes, so angular momentum. Um, and, and, you know, this is a, an extension of quantum teleportation. It's just with quantum teleportation, you just have a single input here instead of this entangled um, input. And, and it's very, this is very useful as a, um, a quantum interconnect. So you can link up, uh, you can imagine concatenating these and distributing entanglement over longer and longer uh, distances. Uh, and, and beyond just being uh, good for applications, this, is, this has been used as a fundamental sort of test of quantum non-locality. Uh, you can think, you know, one and two are, are that state is non-local, but sort of, Loosely speaking, one and four is even more non-local and so on. And uh, I, if you're interested, I encourage you to check out some of these uh, papers for that. Uh, and it's kind of focusing in on how would we do this in the time frequency domain. So remember, I described these uh, multi-mode time frequency entangled states that have many different color combinations. Well, one thing you could do is you know, put your these two photons onto a beam splitter again, and then measure one to be red and the other to be blue. Red and blue, remember, these are just relative, you know, they could be, they're just relatively red and blue compared to some reference. And uh, when you do that, you project one and two onto this red, blue, minus blue, red kind of bell state. Uh, but so what you're doing is you're starting with this multi-mode kind of thing and projecting onto this bimodal distribution of uh, photon one being blue and red being two being red and vice versa. Uh, recently, uh, this, uh, this happened in Alessandro Federici's group in Edinburgh. They had a very nice paper where they um, start with sources that are inherently bimodal by engineering the crystals that produce the photons. And so, uh, you start with a state that's inherently bimodal, then you don't have to do anything fancy here. You just get a click detection, you know, coincidence, and, and you produce the same state, a state identical to what you started with at the output. So, so that's really nice. But okay, so um, what do we wanna do here? The question is, can we upgrade this entanglement swapping protocol to uh, make use of the fact that we're, we're having, you know, in general, these multi-mode entangled states, uh, everything I've described right now with entanglement swapping has been this sort of bimodal, like uh, two result thing. And uh, one thing that's pretty well known in quantum optics is that using this kind of beam splitter measurement, uh, if you have like a two dimensional entangled state, you can only distinguish uh, one out of the, or three out of the four uh, possible bell states. But uh, if you have something like this, that's many dimensional, can you make use of that somehow? Can we, um, particularly, can we measure all of these colors together and, and sort of in, in one take? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, and the way, the way we do that is by using the magic of frequency to time mapping. Um, also known as dispersion or rainbows. So again, as we uh, looked at earlier, if you have a pulse, it's composed of many different colors. And if you put a pulse uh, of light through say some, some glass, in this case, like single mode fiber, optical fiber, after propagation, the, uh, the colors are gonna spread out. So red is gonna come out first and blue comes out later. And if you can uh, detect the arrival time with respect to a reference, uh, you're essentially, that gives you a proxy for uh, measuring the color of that. And you can do this even with a single photon, take your photon and you spread it out. 
measure the arrival time, it tells you the color of the photon. Um, so, so that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, both of these are in this uh, nice review from Nature Photonics back in 2013. The other way is to use a um, sort of a more fancy setup, uh, a chirp fiber Bragg grading, which is also a fiber, but that's been imprinted with a varying index of refraction. And again, uh, because of the periodicity of this, uh, it can make essentially blue comes out first, red, red goes further down the line, comes out last, measure the arrival time, that tells you the color. In our experiment, we use both of these. We have these fiber spools that are actually right behind me here for, for doing this kind of um, uh, measurement and also the chirp fiber Bragg grading for doing this. And uh, I, think, I think Michal might recognize this uh, picture because this is the exact same Bragg grading that, was, uh, that he had worked on in this paper from 2017 back in Oxford, um, which essentially uses two of these to map out a joint spectral intensity of, of two photons. Um, so we're using the actually the same uh, the same fibers. These are kind of hard to, to come by. So uh, Brian brought them over from Oxford. Um, yeah. So how do we implement uh, what it is that I'm talking about? So we have this entanglement swapping setup to two sources of multi-mode entangled photons photon pairs in time and frequency. And so you have source one has signal is A, idler is B. For source two, B is also idler, signal is A. And so what, what we're doing is taking the idlers, B1 and B2, putting them through a beam splitter and implementing this measurement that I'm describing by operator pi JK, which is essentially measure the spectrum of this photon you get a result omega j, some frequency. And for this photon, you get omega k. And both of these you're measuring with a, a long fiber, um, like I described earlier. And, and so you build up you know, your statistics. So for, for you know, j, um, it's just a label that you can, you, know, you label these discrete bins. Um, so zero is your central frequency, for example, so 830 nanometers. Um, and, and kind of show that more pictorially, this is the, the JSI of source one or of source two because they're as close to identical as possible. And if you measure the idler photon, um, so this is idler, uh, at frequency omega j, that projects the signal photon onto this mode phi j. And same thing for omega k. And so if you, you do it one way, you get that photon one is in phi j and photon two is in phi k. But because you had a beam splitter, you get a minus sign uh, with the vice versa. So the, the idea is this, uh, a measurement at j and k heralds the state psi j k, which is made up of these two, uh, two combinations. And that's your bell state and these pulse modes. So the state phi j describes a single photon in this pulse mode phi j. Um, and uh, just for reference, phi j is completely determined by the original joint spectrum. Phi j is this, uh, this pulse that you get when you detect the idler photon at omega j and, and you know, it's renormalized. So it's, it's completely determined by the, um, the, the source spectrum. Okay, so say you do this, what's the probability of getting a click at omega j and a click at omega k? Well, you can think of these as, you know, you're looking at these two so, photons. So, Sofian, uh, can, can yes. I interrupt you? So, so I understand no. that here you just measure the time of the click, yes, in fact? It is the time, yes, but with reference to, the, to, the, to a clock, which is, um, I'll, I'll describe when, when I kind of describe this setup in more detail, but the clock comes from the laser. So it's, uh, yeah, you are measuring the time, but it is a proxy for the frequency. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so what is, you know, if this is J and this is K, what is the, the probability of getting a click at JK? 
Well, again, so you, you're thinking of these idler photons and they're uncorrelated and they each have this sort of like distribution around some central frequency. They go through a beam splitter. Well, because they're completely uncorrelated, you have this sort of just big blob, a product of, of, of this in each direction, except for this uh, narrow sort of valley that's sort of empty. And um, I, I, I hope that uh, maybe some people can guess why that is. Maybe in the quantum optics people, why, why is there no counts in this direction? That there's any guesses? This is when J is equal to K. So the, the reason I don't have any coincidences when J equals the K is because of Hongo Mendel interference. So photons that have the same frequency will bunch together and I won't have a photon here and a photon there at these uh, at identical frequencies. And so this is the, um, uh, I try to kind of keep it light on the math here. There's, there's a lot of math in the papers if you're interested. It's, um, it's simple math, but it gets very involved just calculating these kind of quantities. Uh, but it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's the product of these, um, uh, of these distributions minus this um, diagonal here. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a probability of getting uh, JK, but yeah, once you get that, what you assume is that you've heralded a state in one and two, the state psi JK, um, that, that's the claim, but now how do we characterize that? Well, one, way, one thing we can do is take the you know our state psi jk so photon a1 and photon in a2 and measure the joint spectral intensity and this measurement we do with the uh, fiber bracket grading because it's um, high resolution and so you have your state that we claim to have um, produced the psi jk and, and what you should see is that it's joint spectral intensity which i'm labeling as fjk is these kind of like this bimodal distribution centered at omega j, which is the central frequency of this, and omega k, and, and the other way around. So there's a symmetry about this line. Okay, so we, so we do that measurement, and we collect all of the data, and this is what we see. It's, it's encouraging because there is this empty valley, like I referred to, because you shouldn't herald anything when j equals k. But remember, so for each of these data points, We've also labeled uh, the J, K corresponding to each of these. Um, this is our four photon measurement. It's, there's four numbers that we're recording. So these two numbers, and for each of that, there's two numbers here. And so we can bin each data point here according to whatever J and K was associated with it. And that's when you see this. There's a lot more information here uh, that you only access by binning it according to this and and what you see is sort of what you expect the farther away you are from this degeneracy line the the farther apart these two um, modes this bimodal distribution start to get so this is um these are all the fjks for each each side jk state and so this is f1 negative three and this is f negative two two uh uh, and again, these are, this is the probability of getting FJK, and what and this is the weighted uh, tracing over all of this. This is everything. So the the sum of over J, JK of of these times the probability. So can, can yeah. I ask you something? Mm -hmm. So 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 from what mm -hmm. you said, it it seems that this Hongomandel Hong Hongomandel effect is. Is something that makes your life more difficult, yes, or uh, because it reduces the rate of coincidences. It does reduce the rate along along uh, along this line, sure. Uh, but it's it actually how much it reduces the overall rate depends on uh, depends on the amount of entanglement you start with. Um, I can get back. Yeah. But okay, but in some sense, it reduces the quality of your entanglement swap. No. Right? No, I, uh, the quality ultimately depends on uh, 
uh, it ultimately depends on your measurement and, uh, and how identical your sources are. Okay, but 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 uh, like the efficiency of the sure process. sure I guess if you if you had less entanglement, let's say you had uh, two factorable sources, the expectation is that none of this would happen. You wouldn't see anything because the if the photons going in are identical, you will never get uh, a coincidence at the output. So uh, okay, and 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 the other question yeah. is that apart from Hongo Mandel effect, of course, if you have like orthogonal states, then also you just have 50% chance of observing coincidence, yes? Uh, in the measurement, because they can randomly just go both to the same output point. That's if, uh, that's if you start with a two-dimensional state, yeah. Uh, uh, sort of, if you start with a bimodal state, like the, the one from uh, the Federici group that I showed, then you have, I think, yeah, you have a 50% chance of a coincidence, something so, like So is it so that, uh, like the the efficiency of your entanglement swapping will never be larger than fifty percent. Um, so so in this in this particular scenario, uh, the more entanglement you have, the more chances you have of getting a coincidence, um, relative you know normalized to whatever rate you start yes. with. Uh, but you know, so what you're counting on is these two heralding photons going past each other at the beam splitter. Or, or both reflecting, right? Uh, and that, that happens more and more likely. Yeah, I guess you're limited by 50% in the sense of like, okay. yeah, 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 okay. No, that- Okay, yeah. yeah, sure, thanks. No, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, the sort of the background, flat background is 50%, that, that's correct. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, to just continue down this, we compare this to a simulation which, Again, I will remind you that the uh, the only parameters. So we we do a simulation here based solely on the uh, the measured joint spectral intensity of the sources. This f function uh, that helps to determine everything because then you choose the omega j, and that determines the phi j. And the same thing with k, and, and this gives the simulation. And this is the uh, the data, which is in, in nice agreement with that. Uh, but now we want to show not only, okay, so that was nice because they're anti-correlated, but uh, to show entanglement, you have to show that it's not just correlated, but there's, it's a superposition. And so one way of doing that is to use two photon interference. So instead of, uh, so you take your A1 and A2 and put them onto a, another beam splitter and scan a delay that I'm calling here tau s and measure the coincidences as a function of that. And to see how that works, we can go back to the classic result of Hongo Mendel interference, which says that if uh, you have two identical photons, meaning they occupy the um, they occupy identical modes in all of the degrees of freedom, polarization, space, and time, which you manage by scanning this delay, that as you get to zero time delay, you see a dip in the coincidences. And that's because the identical photons, uh, because of their bosonic nature, they'll tend to bunch at the output of a beam splitter. They'll, go, they'll take the same path and you don't get coincidences. On the other hand, if you have two photons in a state like this, which they're not identical, but they are, um, uh, they are anti-correlated. There's a symmetry about here. And it's not only that, but in this case, it's anti-symmetric. It's this minus this. The, if you do the math, the prediction is that at zero delay, instead of anti-bunching like this, or instead of bunching, I should say, you get anti-bunching where the two photons take opposite paths. And in the case of this uh, frequency anti-correlation, as you scan the delay, you see this oscillatory behavior as a function of the difference frequency. So delta omega jk is omega j minus omega k. With, uh, with some envelope. And this has been used uh, a lot of times to verify this kind of, kind of entanglement. So we do that, we take that scan, scan the scan tau. Uh, if we collect all the data, we see this sort of mysterious peak that is um, also promising. Uh, we we're talking about this anti-symmetry leading to this. Uh, we'll get back to that soon. But again, remember each of these data points 
not not just the sum but each data point contributing up to here has also associated with it a j and a k so we bend each data point according to that and we get this distribution so as you go along with j and k the farther away you are from the line of degeneracy the more um the more oscillations you see which is the sort of uh two slit interference kind of kind of behavior which um I, I will show you again pretty soon, but again, this is this is P J K of tau. So as you know, it depends on on these heralding frequencies like four and negative four. It's going to be more um, more oscillatory, and and this is the probability of getting this. Oh, and in fact, we have colored the backgrounds of each of these pixels according to the total number of data points. So this just mirrors this. It's just from negative four to four. So it's a short, rather a short range here, but that's um, these colors, um, if I go back, are just these. Um, and, and this, what we're looking at here is the, uh, the, the weighted sum of these and, and this peak sort of just survives. And we'll get back to that um, shortly. Uh, again, comparing it to the simulation, which, strictly just comes from s uh we see this very nice agreement and then you know uh per bin what what kind of oscillations you expect and to kind of go back to this we measure these and but we're also at the same time recording the jk bins each data point here corresponds to and likewise here and you bin them according to this and and you reveal a lot more information um for this, this breaks down into all of these, and the uh, the peak breaks down into all these fringes, and so you see this two slit sort of interference behavior where the farther these two um, modes are, and this bimodal distribution, the the more oscillations you have, and and both of these individually match the uh, simulation. Now I want to show you quickly the experimental um, setup as we did it. Um, which again is, is, is right behind me. So we have our, uh, as our source, this uh, titanium sapphire laser. Um, so 80 megahertz rep rate of pulses, short pulses, 100 femtoseconds. We pick off some of that to use as a reference. That's our clock. And then uh, most of it goes to pump this second harmonic generation to generate blue light. And that's our pump for parametric down conversion. And our two sources are actually a single, um, crystal which we double pass so we pass it once and you create a pair of photons that's source one signal one and either one and you reflect off uh, this mirror and you go back and that's source two you produce another pair signal one two and idler two we can measure the joint spectral intensity due to each source and so we see the entanglement so that's source one and that's source two um, and the entanglement again is these uh, anti-correlations uh, and based on you know fitting a gaussian to this thing that's that's how we generate all our simulations um, so for the entanglement swapping then we take idler two and idler one so b1 and b2 put them through a beam splitter and measure the spectrum at the output using the the fiber spool and we generate this you know distribution uh, in j and k and then for each of these, we are also at the same time recording the joint spectrum of signal one and signal two, which obtained this. But again, remember, um, this has more information when you take into account the corresponding J and K. And to verify the entanglement, we take uh, one and two and put them through another beam splitter, scan another time delay, and um, and, and measure the, the two photon interference. Uh, finally, what, what I want to go back to is when you have this full thing, you haven't resolved the J and K frequencies. Um, what can we make of that? What can we make of this uh, valley here? And what can we make of this peak here? Uh, which again, these are formed by just summing over all, the P, uh, all of the J, K. So you're tracing over all the idlers. Well, you can think of that as a mixed state. 
because for each JK, you herald a state psi JK, which were uh, taken to be a pure state. And um, this full state is just, you know, just an incoherent sum over all of these, which is a mixed state very much, but it's still anti-symmetric. And uh, that's evidenced by this peak. And to kind of show you that a little bit more is um, just imagine having a, some arbitrary two photon state described by this big density matrix, four variables because there's two photons. So X and X primer for photon one, Y and Y primer for photon two. And this is impinging onto this beam splitter and you, uh, and you set a time delay zero. At zero time delay, if you do the math, the probability of a coincidence is just this integral over, uh, over two frequencies, X and Y. And when they're identical, this goes to zero. Um, but the, the crucial point is if this row one, two here, if it's separable, if it can be written as a sum of row one of X, X prime and row two of Y, Y prime, then you can show that this probability of coincidence does not exceed one half. Uh, it's uh, you either get a flat background or a dip. You don't get a you you don't go above uh, this background, and and the fact that you do is a um, is because of this non separability, because for all separable states this is true. Okay, um, I'm gonna show uh, in the time that I have yet. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Uh, well, 10 minutes, I would say. 10 minutes? Okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Maybe even yeah. a bit more. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. so I'll, I'll, I'll show you some, some other stuff that we were able to get out of the setup. And then, uh, yeah, and then kind of conclude and go to questions. So one thing to notice is that we actually had to have two time delays. Uh, and they were both on source one, because if you remember, um, both sources are derived from the same crystal and, and the, the first photon pair comes out first. And so it has to be delayed to be able to meet with the second pair to do this Belsane measurement or to do this measurement here. So we have control over two time delays, tau s and tau i. Tau s was what we use for verifying the, uh, the entanglement. But what happens when tau i is non-zero? Well, in general, you herald this Bell state, psi jk, which has a relative phase for small time delays tau i between um, a relative phase between these two terms, which goes as the, the uh, frequency difference times that time delay. So for every jk, it's a different phase. That's why it's uh, theta jk. Um, that's not going to change the measured joint spectral intensity. So those, that bimodal distribution, because that's going to be just the mod squared of this. It's not sensitive to that phase. But, um, but as far as the uh, interference here, it's going to have an extra phase. Essentially, you're going to be able to go from, you know, when this is, uh, when theta is zero, you have your minus. But when this is um, uh, pi, you're going to have a plus for example. So uh, looking for at a specific JK, as we vary tau i, you see that this, um, uh, this phase, that you, you see the effect of this phase. Uh, and that's for a particular J and K. Now, if you look at all of them, you see the effect of, you know, so for each of each JK here, we've, we've done every other, um, every other one just to show the variability some more. Uh, but we take these seven different values of tau i, and you see that it shifts along in this you know, consistent manner. Um, also, similarly, if you look at the, you don't resolve either j, k, or any, any frequencies, just you scan the two time delays and look at the probability of interference. You get this, uh, this is what you predict to see, which is kind of, not nice to look at right here, but let's break it down. You have some background term, which is just as you go far away, 
just the background probability of a coincidence. And then uh, you have these two, which is, as you scan the, the idler time delay, you have, a, you have a dip corresponding to just the idler photons and same thing with the signal. And then, but you also have in the middle, you have this peak, which comes from the, um, the entanglement, just like we said earlier, that, uh, that uh, contributes that Hongo-Mandel peak. Uh, and you can also, if you look at this peak term here, so that's the plus, it looks like a uh, 2D Fourier transform of the joint spectral intensity. Uh, just, yeah, from that and then, mo and then mod squared. So that's, that's this diagonal term here. So we measure that and it, um, it looks just like what we predicted where you have the dip in this direction, that dip, and then the, the central diagonal peak. Um, the other thing we were able to look at is, um, well, again, so we measure the joint spectrum of the sort of heralded mixed state. That was this big FJK, which is this big blob with, um, with the valley in, in the middle. But what happens if you, instead of doing that, you put that on a beam splitter and sit at a fixed time delay and measure the spectrum. So now you're doing this uh, spectral interferometry kind of thing, which you would be familiar with from classical optics if you have two pulses. Well, if you, if you do the math again for the probability of getting coincidence, uh, what I'm calling X, Y is just like J, K. So this is X and that's Y. For a separable state, you have this. And in particular, for an anti-symmetric state, like we described earlier, the one that's made up of um, J, K minus K, J, you have this. And the main thing to notice is this. For the separable state, you have a cosine term, which only modulates this term. Whereas for the anti-symmetric state, it modulates the whole distribution. Um, and, and we were able to, to look at this and for the anti-symmetric state, fair, uh, sure enough, everything is modulated by these fringes uh, at the difference frequency. So tau, tau gives you the uh, sort of the periodicity of these fringes. Whereas, um, whereas for the separable state, you only have the modulation right there in the middle, just along, along this line here. Um, yeah, so with that, I'd just like summarize so that was just some, the, at the end, that was just some preliminary data. But in summary, the main result is that we have this parallel heralding of, of all these different bell states that are centered at different frequencies. And we can get these all in one take because of the multi-mode uh, nature of the sources, right? So you can have as much entanglement as you like. And as long as you keep resolving, every time you resolve, you can get all of these in one take. And you're going from these identical copies of multi-mode states to all of these dif distinguishable bimodal bell pairs. And I like to think of this as it could be a way to uh, multiplex uh, in the frequency domain, these quantum networks. So we, you know, entanglement swapping, we like to think of there's a, Charlie here is making a measurement and then connecting the photons that Alice and Bob have based on that measurement. Well, in this multiplex kind of setup, you can have many Alice's and many Bob's and just one Charlie that's making these frequency measurements. And based on the result J and K, Charlie can connect Alice J to Bob K and so, or any different combination of those. Uh, so that's, um, that's one way this could be used to sort of multiplex uh, in, the, in, in the frequency domain, uh, which is very easy to sort of, you know, have a spectrometer to, sort of sort out all these different frequency modes. And the other thing that, that I, I think we can uh, sort of get out from this preliminary data is that we have these different ways of witnessing entanglement, even for mixed states of photons, such as this uh, 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 2D peak and this spectral interferometry. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank my co-authors, Valerian, Alex, and Brian, who is my PI, and that's him. And this is our group here at Oregon. And thank you all for, for having me in. Uh, we're hoping to get these uh, uh, results uh, published soon, but for now there, you can find them on the archive. And I'll 
take any questions for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sofian. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, are, are there any questions? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I have one technical question as a theoretician. I was curious when you you had this nice uh, plots of the Hongo Mandel effect and comparing some kind of your experimental data to um to the to the predictions. I was I was wondering, for example, this one versus yeah. this one. So I was wondering because you have kind of two stages. You have the idler measurements to measure JK, you know. And mm -hmm. then you measure the signal. So to generate the left-hand plot, do you kind of assume a theoretical model for both the idler and signal, or you actually take the idler to be the experimental data and based on that? Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So we, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So what we do is we um, we calibrate our spectral measurements of the idlers. So this. Uh, uh, this is obtained from from just calibrating our spectrometers, which are the the fiber spools, and so we say we decide that zero refers to um, you know zero zero refers to to this pixel, and based on that, um, but and the, based on that, and based on the joint spectral measurement of uh, of this f omega omega, uh, that completely determines what this is. And once you so determine my, my that, that is, yeah, my question is then: Are the colors also models? So, in as you said, you calibrate your spectrometers, but mm -hmm. actually, when you, what are the intensities in that? Uh, so the plot. You oh, the show, the intensity is in this. Yeah. So the colors. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are also from uh, from this distribution. So which the is, which is measured or is also which modeled? is measured. It is. Uh, it is exactly is this, uh, this. This. So you fit a you fit a Gaussian to this. It's okay. it's a double Gaussian in two dimensions, and so it gives you both uh, intensity, uh, and that and that's how you get sort of the extent of the wavelengths. And so from this, you can say, I'm going to call eight twenty. Uh, say that that's omega, uh, omega three, and so that determines what 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 that's going to be. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Sure, that's nice. Yeah. Can I have another question, Michal? Or yes. Okay, so unless, the other question is general. It's like you show this motivation with Alice and Bob, mm -hmm. and then I was wondering, your process is still kind of random, no? The, you cannot yes. guarantee which J and K uh, you're gonna measure on the idler. Exactly. On on any given shot, the J and K that you get is completely random. But it's it's known before, uh, in principle, Charlie will know. Okay, I got this J and this K. That means I'm going to distribute these photons to Alice J and, and Bob K. Okay, so, so it's is, uh, there, is there any ideas of doing some adaptive? I don't know, op active optics. Do yeah. So in principle, and... you could you could implement like a uh, if you, like a shift. To shift all the J's to to uh, to a single value by doing a uh, is that what you mean? So you can do a frequency well, I'm, shift. I'm, as a theoretician, asking is there any kind of experimental platform nowadays that can kind of do it? And we are talking talking about the future. I'm not criticizing; it's just to know yeah, where yeah. we are. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I'm thinking in particular. I think it was. Uh, um, I think Cole Hammer might have been, uh, done this, where you take essentially. Uh, they take a single source, so just like this one, and you, uh, based on what results you get for the idler, you know how much to shift the signal photon to get them so that they're all in the same frequency. Uh, so, so that's one way you could adapt. Essentially, you're turning this, uh, these sort of correlations into something that's all of, in the same mode. And I imagine you could do the same thing in this in this scheme, where based on what Charlie gets, J and K. So yeah, this is again uh, this particular thing has not been implemented, but you could mm -hmm. conceivably uh, put all of these into the same state, into the same Bell state, and okay. and and that 
uh, in principle will give you more counts, all, but they're all going to be the same identical state that you herald. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So uh, I, I have one. Uh, so you show yeah. you show generation of those bimodal uh, entangled states from mm -hmm. the, the, the multi-mode initial entangled states. Yeah. Could you extend the scheme to generate uh, not bimodal but more multi-mode uh, states after entanglement swapping? Uh, you know? Yeah. So so the so I guess you mean to yeah. Based on what Charlie obtains, then uh, then what Alice and Bob share is something that looks more like this, a multi-mode. Yes. Yeah. The only way I know of doing that is is uh, if Charlie performs a sum frequency generation measurement, uh, because then uh, you you project onto the sum frequency, which is going to be the um, uh, sort of the reverse of of parametric down conversion, and you measure this sum frequency, then you're uh, it's undetermined what the individual frequencies are along a, along a whole range. And then, and then that could produce that. I actually um, have a, uh, a PRA about, uh, ab about doing stuff along that line, but it's, it's just theory, but I can, um, I can share that with you if, um, if you're interested, but yeah, it, it, it can't be done with a beam splitter and, and, uh, frequency resolved detections that can only do bimodal. It's okay, just here that we're you. doing many of them. Sorry? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? If not, well, let's, let's uh, thank Sofian and, and thank you for participation.